Hello, and welcome to What Sex Got to Do With It. We're here with Heather Remoff, my favorite 84-year-old great-grandmother <laughs> in all the United States. Wow. And, uh, and, and so, um, we're still 84, right? Oh, yes. Okay, oh, yeah. all right. Don't, 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 don't. But yeah. of course, that means I'm in my 85th year. You do know yeah, that. Yeah, I understand. I understand. So, I've just been yeah, saying yeah. Uh, yeah, 80, yeah. 84 no, no, for a little no, while. No, so, it's so. going to stay that way. It's gonna, so, it's yeah, gonna, for a little bit. All right, that's fine. That's mm -hmm. fine. So, so, um, so the, um, the name of this chapter is First Words, the Evolution of Language. I, I think I have a good sense of where this title came from. But Oh, we, give, but, me, you, give me your sense of it, Len. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. I'm asking you questions okay. here. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, you, you know, that's sort of an expression I hear. I think yeah. it, it probably has biblical origins. You know, yeah. in the beginning there was the word, I'm not a church person. Yeah. But I, and other books on the evolution of language, we use that expression, first words. I think there was actually a, a book that was a collection of essays on the evolution of language that might have been called first words. But, um, I so much believe that Homo sapiens starts with language. Gotcha. And so understanding the origin yeah. of of language right. is such an so is right. is that what you were thinking of, Tommy? Uh, well well I well, I guess having read the all of it, I mean it it just made sense that he, he, what you were thinking is that the humans the language was what really separated us you know and mm -hmm. so the only reason i didn't want to answer the question which you got me to do <laughs> anyways is that i didn't want to spend a whole lot of time on this okay. you no, know that's cool. because this chapter is just so full of okay. questions in and i'm just gonna have the hardest time keeping everything you know to 28 minutes and 10 seconds you know but i will start with some reading you know uh, the confession uh in uh, one of the early paragraphs, and you start with, okay, I confess that recall of my interviews with women has influenced my speculative account of the <laughs> origin of our species. I find it impossible to put out of my mind that one woman told me regarding her decision to have sex for the first time with the man she later married, he gave me a bite of his peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and the next thing I knew, <laughs> we were in bed. Was that literal? Was it oh, literally that, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Yes, oh, little, literally a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Was it? Just, so, and, but the fact that he, he, I think he may have made the peanut butter and jelly, it was his peanut butter jelly sandwich, and I, he gave her a bite of it. He literally fed her. And so that, uh, it, it, you know, and the reason that I recall that is that I was imagining my hypothetical Garden of Eden, where suddenly we have this, I think it was in that chapter, where suddenly there's this, pro, what I call prototype one, this little baby that's been born with 23 chromosome pairs. Yeah. And I began to imagine that what would happen to that uh, prototype one as the child grew and, and demonstrated various skills that would emerge as, as the child reached uh, uh, maturity, and I think that's why, because I was imagining, oh, he's smashing a nut with a rock that other uh, primates can't do, and then he's feeding one of the females that's watching. And then I think I, I'm, I think I recall at that point I went to, oops, maybe I'm, I'm taking this story too far. I can't help but remember, but I, I envisioned the courtship feeding as being being an early. Uh, yeah. An early innovation. Yeah, no, no. I was just, I was just wondering if maybe, yeah. you know, that. But was. that's a true. No, that yeah. that was a genuine quote from one of the women I yeah. interviewed. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love it. I love it. That's great. And, you know, it makes me, um, um, you know, me, it, I, all, I I sometimes go through these phases where I eat a certain food uh -huh. a lot for a while until I'm just tired of it. So now I feel like PBJs kind of back in in uh, <laughs> my <laughs> my near future. You know, uh, so uh, so. I, but then my whole deal is that I have to be careful about giving someone some of my PBJ because I don't know if I'm sending like the, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the, the wrong signal. Yeah, you have to, you have to watch. Yeah. 
So I think we touched on this, me, in, in some of the earlier um, segments. Okay? But I am still kind of fascinated by this whole notion of the one of a kind, you know, um, um, variant, the naked ape, as you call mm -hmm. call the, the, the individual. Um, how it's able to reproduce? Because we, earlier on you said, well, there might be a, the situation where we have um, multiple or, or more individuals are undergoing these fusions, I meaning on chromosome right. two. You know, so it's not happening just in one place, it's happening. If you, anything that's causing that. You know, but it just seems that, it seems like the frequency still has to be fairly low. You know, oh, I think you know, it probably was low. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lynn, there's so much we don't know, yeah. in part because we're locked in right. to what you and I were talking earlier right. about the, Dar the early Darwinian notion right. of natural selection, which I, I do believe needs to be updated. But, like, for example, the, the, what used to be called dark and RNA, I think it's now called non-coding RNA, yeah, yeah. A lot of that may be viral in origin. Right. So, you know, we don't know. It, 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 when we were infected with viruses, just look at how COVID-19 has right. impacted so many different body parts. Right. That, I mean, people get all kinds of reactions right. from having been infected with that particular virus. I think it's even possible that there could have been a viral infection that swept through that might have made um, the telomeres right. uh, weak and right. made those kinds of fusions more likely. It, we don't know, yeah. but I don't think it would be a one-off. You know, I think there would. Right. And just like the Neanderthal and the Denisovans, they, um, you know, also have 23 chromosome right. pairs. Right. So that was going on. Yeah. Uh, I guess what I'm driving at, though, is that I mean, would that disruption be so large, I mean, that that kind of individual could only mate and have viable offspring I mean, with another individual that had similar mutations. I, I, you know. I suspect that that is the case, yeah. Lynn. Which I, makes I, it so much harder for, you know, for it to get going because now you just have two individuals yeah. and, and then you're going to have the, kind of like the inbreeding. But, but you know, we, don't, we you know. don't know that it was only two. I mean, that we, because as I said, there yeah. could have been, you know, solar flares. Uh, no. There, there could have been a whole lot of things that might have challenged right. um, the stability of right. our genomes. Right. And as I mentioned, I think in an earlier chapter, I don't think all chromosomes are created right. equal. Some are right. more vulnerable right. to those kinds of copying errors right. and, right. and non-disjunction yep. and so forth. So I, I think it's possible, but again, that's speculative. Right. Would, I'd like to get other people thinking about yeah. this. And, and I the, need more ideas. Yeah, no, no, I agree, and, and you, do spec, you do say that it's speculative, and, and sometimes to me, I'm just kind of interested in the details, I mean, and, and I did not like look at the footnotes closely and then go to the sources in mm. order, because that's not the point really of uh, this book and, and as I mean, we're slowly getting towards I mean, uh, the latter chapters where the whole reason I mean, for this book is going to become really apparent and so um, as I said earlier it's, it's, a, it's a nice little um, uh, mystery you know, hunt, you know, yeah. uh, uh, and, and so I take it for that but, but also along the way though we get to explore some topics and so one is or you mentioned the difference between language and communication. Uh -huh. can, can you tell me? Oh. Yes and um, I think all species plant and animal have communication. And the person who alerted me to the, to the difference between language and communication is a, a link, uh, the late linguist, um, Derek Bickerton. Yeah. And he, for him, for it to be true language, it has to show displacement. And he right. uses the word displacement differently than another linguist, Noam Chomsky does. But for Derek Bickerton, displacement in what lang characterizes language. And that is the ability to describe something that you can't see or point to, something in the past or something in the future, something that's not immediately there. Right. Where he felt that communication is just about things that are immediately there. And it, it was so interesting to me. He started by saying, we need to look at what humans do differently from other primates to get an idea of where that symbolic ability came from, the ability to imagine a past right. and to picture a future, to talk about things that happened over a hill that we can't see. Right. 
And um, so he started, let's look at the difference between humans and, and non-human primates. But then he very quickly veered away from that and, and started looking at, at what I call haploid diploid yeah, right, species right, right, right. and where like honeybees communicate right, right, and right. so forth. But really the difference that makes a difference is the difference between um, humans and non-human primates. And in fact, language is symbolic communication. Right. Um, of all the trillions of species that have ever evolved in the billions of years of life on this planet, only one, only one species has evolved symbolic communication that I know of, that I've ever heard of, and that's humans. So that is the source of our exceptionalism. Language is the source of our exceptionalism. And that's what makes us different. Then that's what enables us to communicate with other members of our species who've been dead for generations. I can talk to Darwin. I mean, I can read what he said. Right, right. Um, it, it's what enables me to communicate with someone on the other side of the world. Right. Um, yeah, I understand. And, yeah. and, and so language just makes us, that is the source of our exceptionalism. Yeah. But I say that it's a double-edged sword. Yeah. Well, I was trying to understand, though, the difference yeah. between language and communication. Yeah, but that's, about... that's the difference, the displacement. Right. And, you know, he was, uh, I forget, one of the examples he gave was, um, you know, buzzards uh, circling over a kill. But to me, you know, you can point at that in gesture, but that's not the same as the true displacement where you can talk about, oh, you know, when I was out this morning, I saw there was a dead um, woolly mammoth on the other side of that hill. And let's go try to harvest some meat from that. Talking about something that you can't see. You right, know? right. Cause, and you say yeah. that I mean, you know, when he talks about, the, like, he, he uses ants and bees communicating mm -hmm. about you know, uh, something else, like it's out of sight you know, as, an, uh, as an instance of them you know, using displacement. I think his whole point is that maybe displacement isn't the difference between um, language and communication, and, and you say that well, essentially, I mean, because they're haplodiploid, I mean, they are essentially I mean. It's almost like one, one individual. Or, you know, have, but, yeah. but, and, but I was thinking, well, yes, we're we're they're, we're diploid, uh, but I mean, we're so closely related. I mean, like when I mean, our, the ge genetics between one individual and another. Humans, just, I mean, just aren't that great. Oh, it's, you know? it's, and then it's, we do, it's, it's not that great at yeah, all. Yeah, and then we yeah. have the pheromones, I mean, and so I was thinking, well, maybe, maybe he's onto something. Maybe it is something other than the displacement that really, you know, is the difference between well, language it, to and me, communication. It, it, to me, language is symbolic communication. Right. Right. And it's that ability to symbolize, to yeah. communicate with symbols yeah. that really does set us apart from all other species. It's, it, it, to me, it, it explains everything. Right. I mean, it, it really does explain how we're so different. And, and it, it's much of what makes us wonderful, right. Len. Right. And it's also, yeah. it, it's got a downside no, no, that's not it. so great. And, and, um, and we'll definitely get into that. Yeah. You know, uh, so, so one of the things you, 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 you talk about is, or you write about, is, is the, um, the olfactory, olfactory receptors mm -hmm. that are found on on the skin. Isn't that amazing? It is. And so it makes me wonder now, do you know if other primates have that also? The ones that precede me, us in the evolutionary tree before I that? I don't that, know that. Because that would be interesting because you, you, you kind of indicate that maybe that is something, you know, that I, I, it, says, I've only heard of it yeah. in relation to humans and right. that's a fairly new, I right. think, discovery in right. relation to humans right. that we have olfactory receptors in our skin yeah. and that to me is fascinating because th to me that's pheromonal communication right. is those olfactory yeah. and I think I know in the book I make a point about uh, we lie with language uh, language right. enables us to lie that's one of the downsides to ourselves and to others but pheromones tell the truth and I think that's one reason why touch is such an important component right, of, right, right. of human courtship. Do you know if there are taste receptors also in the skin? I'm not aware of oh, that. Yeah, I was just wondering. Cause, yeah, no, no, because uh, yeah. smell and taste are so closely yeah. related that uh, that you know, of course, you you can taste 
skin. I mean, skin tastes differently, but that's your tongue that's doing the right. the reception. That I don't know yeah, about. But there, are the, and I think the fact, as I'd explained in an earlier chapter, you know, whenever there's a major genetic right. change, like a chromosomal shift, a whole lot of things change that aren't necess that aren't necessarily. Um, uh, adaptive, but they're not necessarily maladaptive either. They just come along for the ride. And certainly, you know, we've been described as the hairless ape right. or the naked ape. I think right. there was a book, was it Desmond yeah. Morris that wrote it? Was I his book? Who wrote it. Yeah, the, the naked ape. Right. But, you know, the fact that we don't have much hair on our skin and then suddenly they're olfactory yeah. receptors in the skin, touch is a very important part of human courtship. Right. A very important part. And and I think we're reading people's signals and maybe getting a better sense through the messages they're sending via pheromone than we might be through what they're saying. I mean, right. you know. I, I, I hear you. I, and, and, you know, yeah, it's, it is fascinating, you know. Uh, I'm just so curious about all of those yeah. things. See, it, in the preface of this book, yeah. I, I asked my, my imagined reader to read it with an open mind, to forget everything they think they know. Read it with an open mind. You've been really good at doing that, by the way. Yeah. Read it with an open mind. And be thinking about your own theories. Right. Don't accept yeah, my right, ideas right. as the last word, because that's what humans are good at. Right. I want ideas from other people. That's how we build. That's how we build reliable theories, is by incorporating a lot of different ideas. Right. And so I, I really love it when something I write makes someone go, hmm. Yeah. I wonder if that could possibly be true. Yeah. How would that work? Yeah. You know, that those are the questions that right. just just. I find to be so much fun. And, and I'm having one of those moments now, and, and I'm, I'm kind of darting about really rapidly because we're, we're limiting these chapters yeah. to 30 minutes, 28 minutes, yeah, yeah. You know, and this one just had so much to me, so, so I'm not like really <laughs> being going on Yeah, we just have lot. to yeah, touch yeah, on yeah. things. Yeah. But there's one point where you talk about cultural revolution, you know, and, and you say that it, it proceeds much more rapidly than the brain evolves. I mean, and I'm wondering, you know, is it really cultural evolution or is it just kind of cultural fashion? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. It's, it's probably cultural fashion. Yeah. And I think maybe that was a, maybe I was referencing something that Derek Bickert, or not, um, that uh, Terrence Deacon had written yes, in Deacon, his yeah. wonderful yeah. book. Yeah. Um, the, I think it was the symbolic species, the co-evolution of language and the brain. Yeah. And it, in his book, when I read it, he was talking about the cultural evolution of language, yeah. like how new languages right. develop, how quickly that happens right. compared to how slowly the brain evolves. But there I part company with one of the people I most admire is, is Derek Beckert. Yeah. And, um, and that I think the change in our brain, because I'm, I'm such a fan of this theory of it happening at the moment of the, the chromosomal fusion, I think the change in our brain, the ability of our brain to process symbolic um, communication, probably that ability was probably pretty abrupt and pretty fast. So I think that was evolution happening fast. Right. But then, of course, we had to build on it. Right. And and, and so, you know, I part company with with one of my heroes a little bit, but right. he knows much more about. Neurology than right. I do. Right, I mean, right. That, so then, that's his field. So then you don't feel as if we are outpacing our brain ability. culturally. Yeah. Um, well, well, just as a as a species, like like the like the uh, like our language and what we have created as a result of our language mm -hmm. has outpaced our brain's ability to deal with the. Actually, I think actually a little bit we uh, have and. And where I look, where I would go to an example of that would be the digital revolution yeah. has happened so fast yeah. and it's amplified our, what I considered our species specific traits, things that are basic to us, but digital media amplifies it in a way that it, exa it, it exaggerates it. And I think in that sense, we've gotten into a little bit of trouble where our cultural evolution, this, this skill with 
uh, technology that we have has gone so fast that our brain hasn't caught up necessarily, and it, can, it, it, it in some ways it can be harmful to us. But caught up to what? Um, like I, I think we, it disturbs our sense of peace. Like we hear so mm -hmm. much about young people mm -hmm. um, on their screens all the time, yeah. and the rise in the level of their stress and anxiety mm -hmm. as a result of the amount of screen time they spend. And I think that has been documented right. that the two are correlated. So the things that have made us comfortable as humans, right. our technology, that's our cultural evolution, right. has speeded that up in such a way as to cause some disruption well, in our... Well, technology speeded up, not evolution, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 but that, that's the, I'm calling that the cultural, the, the cultural, cultural evolution. evolution. I got you, got you. It's, it's speeded up in a right. way that our biological, right. our biologically social selves are not totally adapted to. Right. You know, are, are not to, uh, right. certainly, I for myself that's very true. I, I I'm a, a pub, uh, publisher's nightmare in that I do no social media. Right, right, right. Well, so so what I find though, when people are doing screen time, you know, they're they're normally communicating with other people. I mean, it's not generally that people are or like doing screen time and only focus on themselves. I mean, that's the wrong way of saying it. That they are in isolation. I mean, oh, that's in fact, true. In fact, a lot of the gamers I mean, are playing like these interactive games with other people. I mean, so, so I see it now as is, can our species handle being as connected oh, as we are and establish, increasing all these other connections. I mean, and, and as you know, as you get more and more connections, I mean, then, then the range of responses that you get increases, but also the probability that you're going to get a negative mm -hmm. response goes up, I mean, and, and so, and, 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 and generally, I mean, it's like I mean, people can handle the positive responses, but the negative ones are what do them harm. Mm -hmm. And I think just as a species, I mean, we're wired up to, you know, react more strongly to the negative input mm -hmm. than, than the positive input, but the more connected you are, the more likely you are to get that, that negative input. And so, so is it, I think, maybe I think maybe where the argument for support is that maybe we just can't handle as much connectedness as our technology has given us. Yeah. And maybe it'll take a while before us to evolve to that. Maybe we can't. Maybe it's just too much. I mean, and maybe we have to figure out a way to, to decrease the, the amount of connectedness. And those, are, those are such good questions yeah. to discuss. I think those are, are things we have to talk about. Uh, I, I, well, <laughs> yeah. I, you're ambitious for me. <laughs> yeah. well, so, so, so I'm going to cut you off just a little bit because I just have one more question. Maybe I can have, ask it some other time, but right now it's staring me in front of me. Do you think there could have been some other reason for a concealed ovulation? Other than a mutation? No, no, not the cause, I mean, but you say that concealed ovulation I mean, allows for, for deception I mean, or... or, or because uh, uh, this is, because he, 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 it's you're talking about truth and lies, I mean, mm -hmm. in the section, you know, and so, so, I mean, what do you think was the evolutionary advantage of having the concealed ovulation? It gives women more choice. It gives the female much more choice. You think uh, there could have been any other reason for it? Uh, well, I, again, I think yeah. that I, I believe that that was a pretty abrupt. Yeah. I don't think that was selected for. I think that happened. It just happened. And then, right. okay. And then we used it in a way that benefited us. But I don't think concealed ovulation was selected for. But if it could be, I think it would be a good thing to select for. It gives women much, much, much more control of their reproductive options. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. And, and um, I'm just scrolling down because I can't remember if this question, it looks like it's not in, oh, actually, I think it might be, you know. Yeah. So, do you think monogamy and marriage preceded language? Oh, <laughs> wow. I, I never actually thought of that. Um, I, well, certainly species that don't have language are monogamous. Yes. So, I, I don't but, think the two, you know, I don't think langu language and monogamy necessarily but, go together. But primates, are they generally, or the... The, our closely related relatives, are they generally monogamous? No, I'm actually thinking more of species of birds that are monogamous. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about... Well, I think language helps 
in pair bonding, I certainly do. Um, and given that I think the capacity for language and the capacity for concealed ovulation came as the result of one yeah. mutation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And the ability also to symbolically create contracts. Yep, yep, yep. Data yep. So you could yeah. consider marriage as like a, a contract, contract I mean, yep. and, and a way of saying, I mean, I own, you know, uh, 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 I possess, I mean, so I'm just really. I, so, think, I think that's a, an, an interesting one to talk about. Yeah, all right. You know, so, so um, yeah, uh, and, and um, I, I do like what you say about mathematics is unblemished, I mean, existence is, yeah, I, I, I think of, um, as, as there's something very pure about math, mm -hmm. you know, and, and when people, you know, um, ask about reality, you know, I think it, it ultimately comes down to one plus one equals two. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and from that, everything flows. I mean, so, so it was kind of um, um, refreshing to see that because you were talking about that in the context of, of, of lies and how uh -huh. math is kind of like it, it, impervious to that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they say you can lie with statistics, but that's not math itself. That's right. us doing something with the results of math. I, yeah, I, 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 I think that's, I really, the mathematical thing is fascinating yes. for me, the purity of that. Yes, you know, and so, you know, uh, we have about a minute and a half left here, and I'm not going to go anything, anything else because we'll go over time. And I, I will just say to folks who are listening to this and watching it, I mean, you know, a, you want to read everything up to chapter eight, of course, I mean, before you read chapter eight, but when you get to chapter eight, it's just so full of, of, of um, interesting information. I mean, uh, uh, it's not the climax, I mean, but, but it certainly takes off. Do, I mean, do you know eight. how that chapter yeah. came to be? I have a close friend who, in California who's interested in linguistics, yeah. and she was coming to visit me. She said, oh, Heather, let's have a salon. We'll invite a bunch of your friends over, and we'll discuss the evolution of language between the lasagna and the cheesecake. And so then I started reading up on the evolution of language prior to Sarah's visit, and that was the origin of this chapter. Yeah, yeah, well. well Related well, to food always, of course. <laughs> yes, yes, well, well, who knows? Mm -hmm. Maybe at some point, maybe there'll mm -hmm. be an opportunity to come back and visit uh, this chapter yeah, because yeah, I, you know, this segment could have been three times as long. Yeah, yeah. But anyways, thank you very much and we'll be coming back I mean, for um, chapter nine, which is called, Can We Rewrite the Script? Yeah, so thank you, folks. <laughs> Thanks, Leonard. Yeah, I did. It we, is fun. <laughs>